I can help you out on that one. Mm -hmm. That way. That's good. All right. Back and forth. That's one more. Uh, back. Can you expand it to the full? Oh, uh, so as the ice uh, diminishes in the Arctic, some people think uh, it must be very safe to go up there and operate, do research. So I think after, after the next talk, we'll, we'll see that. <laughs> That's not necessarily the case. That's uh, one of the reasons we invited uh, Dr. Kathy Crane. She's a visiting professor at the University of Hawaii to talk to, to us about the 2016 search for the Jeanette. That yes, one. I am. <laughs> um, the Jeanette expedition was just a fantastic expedition in its time. It uh, held the attention of almost all the people around the world who could lead into this. The Jeanette was set up by, um, of course, there's a financier named Bennett. He was from New York Herald. Um, and he wanted, his main goal was to plant a U.S. flag on the North Pole. Strange thing about that, yeah? <laughs> Sounds familiar. <laughs> um, they had a very fantastic crew that was set up. It was very diverse. Um, the, the captain of the ship was George DeLong. Then there was um, Melville was a chief, chief officer and a uh, chief uh, engineer, excuse me. And then finally, um, Frederick Chip. The, as soon as the Jeanette reached up to Wrangell Island, well, by the way, there was a plan that they thought, some people thought, that there was warm water coming from the Kurosho Current going up through the Bering Strait that would lead, leave an empty corridor all the, way up to the, uh, all the way up to the North Pole. So they would have an easy ride up there where they could plant a flag someplace. <laughs> but that didn't happen. They... Um, what happened was the Jeanette went up through the Bering Strait and got frozen in to the ice in about two days. And uh, they were frozen in for, for two years. They had a lot of supplies on board. They had hunters on board. They had guns on board, pretty important thing for that. Um, they had fuel. They had a lot of brandy and whiskey, very important. <laughs> But, every, but the whole nature of the expedition was to um, gather scientific information. That was the main thing from the DeLong point of view. Let's see. Um, the the Jeanette uh, gathered copious amounts of information, uh, a lot about water column, ice thickness, um, anything they could do in meteorology. Every member was, had, a, had a role in this. And they stayed together um, pretty nicely all the way until the, until the date that the ship sank. And that was two years after they got, approximately two years after they got sunk in the ice. Um, DeLong over here was a great uh, gatherer of data. And George Melville was the one who really helped the ship survive. <laughs> so their goal was to find the way to the North Pole, and it was beset in the ice in September 1879. And this was supposed to be a fantastic um, break away from the, the dangerous days of the Civil War. It was in the Gilded Age, so people were really looking forward to a brand new forward motion. Um, so it was beset in the ice, and it sank in June 1881. And it was famous for inspiring Nansen's drift on the Fram. Jeanette could be treated as an ac accidental ice station. And in fact, it has been treated as that by Dr. Kevin Wood from University of Washington. These are, this is the Jeanette track. And then all these others are buoys that have been thrown into the, into the East Siberian Sea and Chukchi Sea. And you see what, how it can, you could get the comparison of the late 1800s to the present. So that's a real interest of some of our people that, that want to re retrieve the information from the Jeanette, um, because it does have a record in a, over 100 years ago. Uh, 
when his ship sank, which is on the 12th of June, um, the captain gave an abandoned ship <laughs> um, order, and everyone abandoned ship. Everyone got off the ship, uh, but they took also these gigantic logbooks, carried them on their shoulders. They also took three boats that they dragged along the ice. They were 540 miles north of Siberia. They had to cover that distance to get to mainland. Um, this is Jane Lubchenco looking at this, uh, at the DeLong uh, log. It's right across the street in the archives and um, has an amazing amount of information that, that is retrievable. Hampton Sides is, a, is an author who made a fantastic uh, book called The Grand and Terrible Voyage of the USS Jeanette. And gee, when you read through that, you can see, oh my God, how do they manage to do all of this and survive? Um, four of us that I mentioned there, Kevin Wood, um, Vladimir Smolin, Alexei Ostrovsky, and I, have been working for way more than a year trying to drum up uh, financial support to get ships out there to locate the, the Jeanette. We believe it's in water about 60 meters, 70 meters, something like that, that's what we believed. So we were offered, um, well, let's see, we were offered, we didn't hear any offers for a long time. There was Prince Albert II of Monaco was really interested with his exploration foundation to put something into this. There was, um, there was the National Geographic Society at one point was really interested in putting funding into a program to go locate the Jeanette. Um, there, was, um, there was no funding from the United States to agencies which was a big disappointment. But uh, the Russian uh, leaders really wanted to have Americans on board. And so they, made, they got permissions for several people to, to go on the expedition with them. The main problem was is they only told us that we were going to go a week and a half before we had to go. And it was 40 days long. <laughs> it's biblical 40 days long. So most of the people could not attend because they were, didn't have visas. Only two of us had visas, Russian visas, that we could actually fly to Arkhangelsk and um, board the ship and take the 5,000 kilometer route up to where we thought the Jeanette was, was lying. Now this is a cross section of uh, what the Jeanette looked like. It was really, a, it, it was um, set up like a bark and, but it, had, it was a steam-powered screw, and so they relied on that for their forward uh, momentum. Now, the reports from the people after they got off the vessel was that a lot of this um, upper, upper structure was wiped off during the sinking procedure. And the only thing that was remaining, pro at the time it was going down, was this half of a main mast, some structures over here. This was part of a windmill that George Melville set up. And um, this was the kind of thing that we were, we were trying to train ourselves to look for on the sonar images. Um, the uh, Russian team was um, very well trained. They came out of a group called MTB uh, that was uh, led by Vladimir Smolin. And uh, we brought with us uh, side-looking sonars and remotely operated vehicles and also your standard gravity cores and things like that in case we, we had problems getting any other kind of information. This is an article that came out in the Russian press. The Russian expedition is set to, set to um, locate the sunken U.S. Navy ship. So um, according to the, uh, to the report, the, um, they said in, in the report in the newspapers, the vessel was crunched by ice flows and sank in 1881. All the crew members survived, and all the ship logs and substantial amounts of data survived. The expedition was a sensation in its time, and if located, the ship's remains would provide unique opportunity for scientific research. 
Well, it turned out that um, part of the Jeanette, part of the structure of the Jeanette was found off of southeast Greenland two years later. I don't know which part. Was the part that had said Jeanette on it? I don't know. <laughs> but this was, that really was a clincher for Nansen because he said, okay, you can put your ship way out there in the Arctic and it will drift all the way to the Atlantic and they'll come out again. So that was really a moving force for DeLong. So in the, in the effort for international cooperation, oops, international cooperation, we did not, as I said, we did not get any, any support, financial support from US agencies. But the uh, Russian permission system, which has to go through a lot of different agencies, ended up inviting individuals from the, um, let's see, the Russian Geographical Society, a OAO, Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping, that would be Larry Mayer over there, University of Hawaii, that's me, Naval Research Laboratory, Joan Gardner, University of Washington, Kevin Wood, Oceanography Magazine, Ellen Capel was even going to be on board. And these guys are all good in sonar. They all have great training in sonar, so that's why they were there. At one time, well, we did get the permission for our NOAA Office of Ocean Exploration to send an archaeologist along, but they did not fund the proposal that was sent in to them. Then an underwater archaeologist from the U.S. Navy was, uh, got permission and National Geographic Partners. I have these two, two uh, universities in blue because Kevin and I were the only ones that already had our visas in place. <laughs> you really need more than a week and a half to get a visa to Russia. And um, we had ours um, already from the summer before. We were expecting to do a Rusalka expedition. So we were there, and that was, and we became the United States observers on board this vessel. This is a um, general bathymetric map um, that was showing roughly the location of where the Jeanette was located. He, he, um, they, lo they located a couple of islands. One was Jeanette, and that was named after DeLong's sister and Henrietta after his mother. Um, and I find the coolest thing is, but all those names have two N's and two T's in them. <laughs> I don't know there must be something to it. One of the interesting things here, though, is um, uh, DeLong's navigation was really good with latitude, but he had re really difficult times with longitude, at least uh, 12 miles, nautical miles off. Where is this? Not working. Anyway, um, so we went back through all the records and repositioned where the known locations of these islands were compared to where DeLong had plotted them when he was out there on the course. And we noticed there was pretty consistent 12 nautical miles uh, offset. So we decided, OK, we, we've got to move our whole ideas of where the Jeanette sank by 12 nautical miles. And, um, and we did that. We decided this would make our, our research area, which was the area we were given permission to work in, um, and we wanted to focus on that, er that area. Um, there wasn't an automatic search solution. Um, we did some additional analysis um, by, uh, by looking at the various tracks, the bearings that, the, that DeLong had made on the various islands to give us an idea of the transit of the, of the Jeanette after it went down. Oops. Now this is... Um, <laughs> I don't know how to say it. It's about 5,000 kilometers between Arkhangelsk and, uh, and along the northern sea route doo -doo 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 up to where the Jeanette, we think, sank. Where it sank, but I don't know where it ended up. So, um, so this was a, a, t a tremendous, this is a 12-day journey, uh, just waiting to get there. At the time we left port, all the seas were open clearly open water, the uh, uh, Be Barents Sea, well, the White Sea, Kara Sea, Laptev Sea, and the Siberian Sea in this area was all clear for us. 
to move through it. On board the ship, then we plotted the um, we plotted our best estimate of a region uh, that, based on DeLong's navigation, uh, his bearings from from different islands, and they uh, gave us this circular region here. There. And so we were working on this with the Russian hydrologists, and uh, and this this is our team, our navigation team, trying to narrow down the possibilities of where it may be. Um, I don't like the Arctic without ice, because there's all these storms and you get seasick. This is Kara Gate, uh, right at the right at the entrance to the Kara Sea, where a huge storm came in there. And one of the worst things that happened to us was by the time we got to the East Siberian Sea, there was an ice corridor that was coming down to Siberia. And within that corridor was where we thought the Jeanette lived. <laughs> the ship that we had is an, was an ice-strengthened ship. It was not a full-fledged icebreaker. Um, this is an, one of the ROVs which we're launching over the side. We did have problems with this ice. We were kept trying to maneuver it around from east, west, south, north, trying to get in to that special area which we had outlined, but we were unable to do that. We, however, tested all the equipment in Polinias, our open water area and some of this, and, uh, and it was a boon to the uh, marine, bi marine biologists, such as uh, soft coral up there, these images we sent to the Rusalka, the Russian-American long-term census of the Arctic uh, scientists for them to identify for us. Um, <clears throat> but the next thing that happened was, and I have it in my log book, this is my log book, <laughs> um, was that, the, um, that we got stuck in the ice. We were almost like a Jeanette number two. And very close, about five nautical miles from where we thought the, the Jeanette should be located. So we were stuck in the ice. Polar bears took advantage of this. Oops. Um, and they came up to our ship. The, you know, it's usually not so bad when you're on a ship and polar bears come up because you can drive away from them. In this case, we were, we were firmly stuck in the ice. So they were sniffing through the mess hall, uh, and they, they came up from one of the islands that had just recently been frozen in. The ice, the water had been frozen in. Um, for six days, we were stuck in the ice. Uh, I have in my journal, stuck in the ice, stuck in the ice, stuck in the ice, <laughs> same piece of ice. <laughs> it got to be so difficult, and, and think about this, a normal, one of our normal cruises, you have enough food to live that, for the time you're supposed to be at sea, and maybe a little bit more, just in case you have problems. Water, fresh water. Um, we, we had no guns on the ship. Nothing was able, no one could hunt anything. If this had been the Jeanette, that polar bear would probably have been its uh, meal time, uh, <laughs> its meal steaks on, on, on board the, during dinner. But we had no way to, to protect ourselves from the bears. We had no way to survive a long freezing in that area where the Jeanette survived for two years. It's just amazing. So we were left with a really bad dilemma. And thank God there are some Russian nuclear icebreakers out there. <laughs> we were rescued by the 50 years of, of freedom, victory, excuse me, 50 years of victory nuclear icebreaker, which have been tooling around in the Kara Sea and around. They, there are, they are in the Northern Sea Route to try to help uh, vessels that are going through the Northern Sea Route get through, provide a clear passageway. And uh, they had to come way up to us to get us out of the ice. And one of the funniest uh, parts of this was I, I remember listening to the captain from the, from the 50 Years of Victory to the captain on the Bunitsky, sorry, I didn't say his name, Bunitsky. Um, you call us ice? <laughs> for them, it was like nothing. <laughs> but it was a lot for our ship. 
they did rescue us. We followed them out of that ice corridor. And then our time was up. We had to go back to Arkhangelsk. Um, I was really grateful that Russia had nuclear icebreakers. <laughs> they are going to have nine. So they have six and uh, three more on their way. And um, I kept, kept thinking, God, what, is he, uh, what if we had been in American waters? What would we have done? <laughs> I don't know. It would have been more complicated, certainly. And I, I say but those ships are really great, and they're absolute necessity for traveling on the northern sea route. So the, the bottom line of this is we didn't find the Jeanette this time. We were within five kilometers, uh, with nautical miles, of where we think it is. Um, but it could have been all torn up and gone on ice floes, just like the piece of wood that ended up off southeast Greenland. We really don't know. Um, and in fact, when, I, when, I, when we got back to land, I had some Russian biologists call me up and say, did you guys have a marine biology expedition up in the East Siberian Sea? Uh, well, we really didn't plan on it. <laughs> but yes, we have some information for you. And uh, so this happens to be an area that is so poorly observed in the uh, water column and the sediments and the biota. So what did we learn from this? A lot of things. <laughs> things I knew before, but we had no choice. When we were called up to say, okay, you have your money and you have your ship, now go. And, uh, and that was late September, so most of our time at sea was in October, and we got back in early November. So 40 days out there, October is not a great time to be in the Arctic. And also, do not depend on the Arctic Ocean being ice diminished as much as you would like it to be. This, this ship that we used was not the particular ship we should have used in a corridor of ice. Let me see. <clears throat> so better to use an icebreaker, just in case, because we can't depend on open water everywhere. You can't depend on it. You can't predict it. Um, and so that was, we really needed to have put our expedition on a real icebreaker. We should stage, I think, stage the expedition from a Russian Far Eastern port or an Alaskan port, and that's because it's much closer to Wrangell Island, much closer to where the Jeanette sank, rather than going, you know, 5,000 miles, uh, not a, um, kilometers back and forth to the, to the sinking site. The other thing was we could not operate our tools with that much ice around us and not being able to move. I have operated sonars and ROVs off the Louis Saint Laurent, but it, had, it is a real icebreaker. It moves, it cuts up rice behind it so you can tow your, your wires and they don't necessarily get um, torn up in the ice. But I would just say w what we really had wanted to do when we were trying to get money from our U.S. agencies was to include autonomous underwater vehicles that didn't require tethering, wires, anything, that could actually go under that ice and see what's there and bring back the information to us. But we did not have the uh, finances to provide that. Um, the last lesson learned is to make sure the expedition participants have a way to be rescued uh, and the ship. Um, we had an agreement with um, a global rescue company that would come and get us off the ship as long as we did not go north of 80 degrees. So all of the scientists paid about $300 for this rescue opportunity. And, um, and I, I really recommend it. <laughs> so this is the end of my talk right now. That's a good a thing. Big thank you. What was that? What's that? I didn't hear it. <laughs> it's OK. OK. Um, these are the four people. That's Kevin Wood, me. Vladimir Smolin and Alexei Ostrovsky, and one of our techs, technicians that were running, running the electronics of the other systems. We don't know if we're going this year, so I can't tell anyone if we are. We're probably here a week and a half before. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Actually, we have some questions re I have, related to that. I just want to that. say one thing. Go ahead. Funding came from purely from Russia. The Putanin Foundation funded us, funded the ship, funded the, ice, the nuclear icebreaker, 
funded the scientists on board, and funded expenses of the Americans. So um, this was truly a Russian-funded uh, program. Potanin is a colleague of Prince Albert II, so they have a lot of talking going back and forth. But I, I wanted you to know this, and the, and the Russians were so upset that uh, we had no U.S. Navy uh, on board or people from the U.S. agency signing up to be on board this expedition. I want people to think about that because it is a U.S. ship in, in Russian waters, and we did try. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. And uh, again, we run out of time, but you know, there's a series of questions that I think would be interesting okay. to see if you can answer very quickly. So this is, uh, we've done it before in this symposium, aligning, you know. Uh, so you got to answer really quick. Okay, I'll try. Why was the invitation only given a week and a half prior to the expedition? How much time? Why was the invitation only given a week and a half prior to the expedition? Because the money didn't come forth until a week and a half. Potan and Foundation said, we have the money, we'll send okay, it. Okay, thanks. Uh, were you receiving weather and ice information from Rossi Dromet? We had ice information from Rossi Dromet. We had MODIS access, yes. So you, you knew this was coming? Not until we got there. Okay. <laughs> it came after, right as we got there. Okay. So, uh, All right. Uh, was the 50 years of victory specifically deployed to help rescue the Bernitsky, or did, did it just happen to show up? Well, I don't really know. It was, it was closer to us than other ones, it, but it was in the Kara Sea, the okay. two seas over. But it travels over 20 knots in open water. All right, probably they really yep. requested it. And finally, how can you be sure where the Jeanette is or lies that you would launch an expedition to find it? Oh, this is uh, a comment. There are so many variables which could have affected and may still affect its position. That's true. There are a heck of a lot of things that that affect its position. We can't be entirely sure until we find it. I don't know if you remember the search for the Titanic. It took us three years to find the Titanic. Okay, but it was a landing round, so it has ended. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>